2023 saw a record-breaking $773 million of growth capital total investments in water tech companies, which is up from $650 million in 2022, $470 million in 2021, and $325 million in 2020. Now, that 25% compound annual growth rate may be surprising as, unlike most other sectors of the economy, the water industry doesn't have that poster child company yet that went from VC rounds to spectacular exits, earning big bucks for everybody on the go. So, did those investors just lose their minds? Did they hastily and recklessly get rid of some hundred million that were burning their hands? To figure out, I patiently reviewed 2023's 106 deals, sat down with VCs and investment experts, and rounded that off with 20 years of M&A and exit move records, with the aim to answer that big question, did any VC investor ever make money in water tech? Good news, I think I identified three outliers that may have or may be on the verge of making that big buck. But first, I need to explain to you where this investigation all started. A couple of weeks ago, I interviewed Brian Iverson, the founder of Simbra Capital. He's pretty well known in the water sector as someone who challenges the pertinence of VC in early stage water companies, having written articles like why venture capital is failing in water. He's got a full set of solid arguments to defend that slightly controversial thesis, but the core of it is that first, 10x investor outcomes don't exist in this sector, and second, if they did, they wouldn't exist repeatedly. This turns venture capital into a gamble, which you can happily pass on by rather investing in later stage companies such as growth or private equity. I'm not bashing the industry. It's the approach I'm really curious about because we're still in a first or a second wave of investors in the space. And I'll still challenge you and anybody who has that venture capital fund that actually did what it was promised to do. I could be missing it because I don't know people's returns is that they're not out there. But I do think you and I would be more aware of more significant wins in water tech if I was wrong. Indeed, if Brian was blatantly wrong, I would have been able to come straight back and give him some hands full of counterexamples. But do they exist? At that stage, we don't know. All we know is that money flows in early stage water tech companies are increasing, and I tend to believe that all early stage investors can't be wrong simultaneously. But everybody has an opinion, what matters is hard facts, and Brian knew he had me hooked, so he doubled down later in the interview. You should definitely invite somebody who was successful running and executing a VC fund in water. That's who you should invite. I'll be all ears. But but you're, you're, you're sure I can't find that person, right? <laughs> I'm not sure, because how could I be sure? But I think you should look for it. I don't mind being proven wrong. So if Brian doesn't mind, I crave a good challenge. Let's try to prove him wrong. And let's start by setting the rules. If I don't find anyone that succeeded in reaching a 5 to 10x in an early stage water investment, then Brian's probably right, or you should unsubscribe from this channel because I'm a lame investigator. Please don't. Yet if I find one or several examples of investors that 5 or even 10 x and did so repeatedly, despite the great fun I had to record with him, I may have to call Brian out and affirm he's wrong. Which one will it be? Well, let me bring in my three cases and you'll judge. First, let's look at 2023's largest fundraiser, Gradient's $225 million Series D. To understand why that one is of interest, we have to go back to April 2013, when Gradient raised a $1.4 million seed round from Cranberry Capital. At the time, the company was a pretty fresh spin-out of MIT, built around a very, very niche product, a carrier gas extraction humidification dehumidification process that aimed to become an affordable zero-liquid discharge process, especially in the oil and gas industry. Their first ever commercial treatment facility was still six months ahead, and even though they had won several accolades from the industry, like for instance the Tech Idol contest at the Global Water Summit, I doubt anyone would have bet they would become the water sector's first and only unicorn one decade later. Anyone, except maybe the guy who led that seed round, Keith Wilson, the CEO of Cranberry Capital. But for what reward? Well, bear with me because from now on I will have to speculate a bit. Got your pinch of salt with you? Great, let's move on. In a typical seed round, entrepreneurs give out 10 to 20% of their company's equity. So let me take the conservative end of that range and let's postulate that Keith Wilson took 10% of Gradient at a post-money valuation of $14 million. Let's also assume he didn't participate in any of the company's subsequent fundraisings. Hence, 
he got diluted every time. By the way, Keith, if you're watching this, check your DMs and your mails. I'd love to check my conjectures and part of the challenge was to interview the VC I'd believe achieved the 10x, so that mic is open to you whenever you want. But back to our story. Between 2013 and 2023, Graydon raised a venture round from Wave Equity Partners and then Series A, B, C and D. And while we don't have all the details of all the deals, we at least know that their $225 million Series D made Gradient a unicorn. So it's reasonable to assume that each of these rounds implied a 20% chunk of the company. So if we take all the worst case scenarios for Cranberry Capital, Keith had 10% of Gradient in his hand in 2013. He didn't have any preferred shares or special anti-dilution clauses like a full ratchet or a weighted average in his term sheet never poured one additional cent into the company and got diluted through five successive 20-person rounds. That means he still owns 8% after the venture round, 6.4% after the Series A, 5.12% after Series B, 4.1% after Series C, and 3.3% after Series D. However, as Gradient is now valorized at $1 billion, his 3.3% ownership is now worth $33 million. So within a decade, he did a 24x on his initial investment. But wait, that's your first example and you're already cheating. I'm not cheating. Are you sure of that? Did you forget what Tom Ferguson told you? In terms of the valuation thing, I almost can't overstate the degree to which it is not and should not be important for me. So we need markups and people need to be on the way up. It's like great, but nothing is set until the liquidity event happens. One of the major LPs in the, the venture business calls it the moolah in the cooler. To my knowledge, Graydon hasn't exited or IPO'd, right? Right. So your argument is invalid. Back to work, you lazy froggy. As much as I hate that guy, he's right. Even if all my assumptions are correct, Keith Wilson's 24x won't materialize for as long as he doesn't exist. So that one would be an impressive gray zone, yet it doesn't fully bring it home. But I believe my second one does. On the other side of the US and one decade earlier, another startup was cooking a cool water tech in a quite different application, desalination. Nano H2 was in fact a spin out of UCLA that developed a membrane that aimed to increase flux and salt rejection, hence reducing desalination costs. By 2010, they were commercial and very important if you want to be sexy for investors. By 2011, they deployed their first large scale installation in the Cayman Islands. You can't make that up, right? <laughs> then it went quite fast for them with a deployment in 36 countries and 150 desalination plants in just three years, which brings us to 2014 when LG Chem takes over the company. But what's the investor story behind that trajectory? Well, in 2007, Costla Ventures invested in Nano H2O seed round for $5 million. They kept investing in the two subsequent rounds in 2011 and 2012, alongside respectively one and six other investors. If you don't know them, Kostla Ventures is a very large VC player founded by billionaire businessman Vinod Kostla, hence the name, who is one of the co-founders of Sun Microsystems. And while the firm invests in a broad range of verticals, mostly tech and of course lately AI, their impact investment thesis also leads them to put some bucks in water. In the case of Nano H2O, Samir Cole was the investor in charge and of course, that's when I have to say, Samir, please check your DMs. <laughs> when it comes to numbers, of course, and as Bren warned us, nothing is public, so I'll have again to make assumptions. You know the song, bear with me and take your soul checker with you. But when Kostla put $5 million on the table in 2007, while Nano H2 was still a lab concept, I doubt they did it for less than 30%. I'll then assume that they took a proportional share in the subsequent fundraisers. That's a wild guess, but it doesn't matter that much for today's exercise, so why not? As a result, I estimate they ended up owning 28% of Nano H2O when they closed the exit deal with LG Chem. And if I add up the three investment rounds that to participate in for that, it makes for about 28 million bucks invested. But how much did LG Chem pay for Nano H2O? Well, that one was not disclosed either. It would be too easy. But rumors before the deal suggested that it would be a $200 million story. So let's do the maths. 28% of 200 million dollars makes 56 million and hence a return on investment of two. <laughs> That's supposed to be bring it home. How stupid between 5 and 10? You're right, it's not, but let's look deeper into it. Indeed, the 5 to 10x must be on the early stage money when the risk is higher, not on the later stage follow investments where the technology has been de-risked and proved. So if I now skip the follow investment and only take the diluted piece that Costla Ventures acquired in seed, 
that still makes for 15% of Nano H2O by the time of the exit. 15% of 200 million makes 30 million, and as they paid 5 million for these shares, we've got a 6x factor, and voila, we've got our proven moonshot. Assuming your hypotheses are remotely right. Indeed, hence what I said about the salt shaker. Yet, that's only half of brands ask. Did Costa Ventures repeat that performance? Well, they're not water investors, so their exposure to water is limited, and... And blah blah blah. I stand my point, you still haven't succeeded in the challenge. Okay, you want to be picky, great. Well, I wonder what you have to say about my third one then. Go on, I'll watch. We're crossing the Atlantic for this one as it takes us to Germany where two entrepreneurs founded Inge Water Technologies in the year 2000 to develop and market an ultrafiltration membrane technology they had acquired from a Dutch startup. Building on a quite rare at the time inside out approach, Inge's multibore would become a staple in the rapidly growing sector of ultrafiltration for industrial and drinking water applications. I actually have a first hand story with Inge as I was working for Suez and its Aquasource business unit when we decided to switch from our home produced membrane to Inge's solution to fit into our membrane skids. But back to Inge's development track and to the founder's realization that in the water sector, it takes more time than expecting to go to market, which led them to overcome their cash burn rate by taking an investment from Siemens Venture Capital and Emerald Technology Ventures in 2004 for a down run valuation compared to the precede. This will matter later. On their growth path, they changed CEO, developed sales in 25 countries with flagship references like the Beijing airport and aligned themselves for an IPO supposed to happen by the end of the decade. Plans changed with the 2008 financial crisis, which led to a new venture round with a slightly larger investment pool around Emerald and Siemens Venture and the company continuing its development until becoming profitable just months after a last venture round added Baytech Venture Capital into the mix. With IPO still difficult in the aftermath of the crisis, Inga resolved to exit to a corporate player and in 2011, BASF acquired the company for $106 million. At the time of the exit, Emerald Ventures owned about 25% of the company and that figure is slightly less speculative than the ones I gave in the previous stories as the Harvard Business Review actually wrote a case study on a section of Inga's path. That's where the speculation starts though, as I estimated the shares Emerald acquired in each venture round, knowing their end piece of pie and the overall size of each funding round. I'd estimate they poured about $5 million into Inga, while their shares got acquired by BASF for $26.5 million, which gives us an overall 5.3x on their invested capital, and if I focus on their seed round only, an even more impressive ratio of 7x, which truly foots the 5 to 10x bill. Helge Debel is the investor behind the Inga story, and even though I haven't recorded with him yet, I met him a couple of times and I'm pretty sure I will be able to trap him into an interview at some point. Now of course, if you'd like to help me out in that endeavor, I'd recommend you mention it in the comments and bump the like button on this video to add some street cred to my next invitation to him. Thanks for your support. But remember, the 5 to 10x return on investment is only one of the two criteria we have to meet to prove venture capital can work in water. The other one is can it repeatedly happen? And I'd say yes, for that I would have two more exits from Emerald Ventures to somehow back up my claim as they've sold Optimatics to Suez for an undisclosed amount, I couldn't find any hints as to where it landed, and Pure Technologies for $400 million to Xylem. Wait, they did a $400 million exit and you only bring it up now? Yeah, actually, that one is quite complex because Emerald was a lead investor in the pressure pipe inspection company that merged with Pure Technology that was a public company whose shares were then acquired in a takeover bid by Xylem. Long story short, I couldn't figure out how much of pure technologies Emerald was still holding at the time of the move and for how much they had acquired it. In summary, I'd say Emerald ticks the 5 to 10x return on investment box for sure. Well, I was at least sure of it at the time I recorded and even though I'd still believe that my assumptions are pretty accurate, I have to share you Helge's answer as he says that despite successful water exits, he doesn't qualify to fulfill the two criteria. So I'll make sure to clarify my definitions with him and invite him to the mic as soon as possible we're meeting in three weeks, so stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe. And shows good hints as to how and why it may be repeated that performance more than once. Is that enough to prove Brian Iverson wrong and affirm that yes, venture capital works in water? I'll be honest, I'm using far too much suppositions in my argumentation to be that affirmative with regards to past performances. Now, the part where I'm more affirmative is when I say I believe venture capital will for sure 
mark my words, prove its worth in water in a close future. Digging up today's three examples was quite a journey and there's much more I have to share on the topic in the next weeks, so you probably want to subscribe for more. Indeed, I did a lot of data crunching around the growth capital invested over the past four years, so if you'd like to follow the money with my review of the three water tech sectors that draw the most investments, have a look here. And as this video may not be out at the time you watch this, you may want to dive into my full interview with Brian Iverson instead, and I'll see you next time.